Yo, what's going on, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of Charlie Mike, the podcast. As always, I'm your host, Raul, and your co-host, William. What's going on, y'all? Welcome back. It's so nice to be here in uh, Pearland, Texas, coming to you from the Charlie Mike Pearland podcast studio. Does it ever get tired saying that? No, I don't. <laughs> it sounds like, like a mouthful. It is. <laughs> yeah. It is. It is. But if you're curious about where we're at, you can find us online at www.parallandpodcaststudio.com. So you can make it easy. Yes. But man. everything we do is underneath Charlie Mike. So it's just, it is. I like it saying is. it. And it's, it's, it's incredible. Man. It I, is. I have, you know, just like we were saying the other day, man, it's just, I'm excited to get here. I'm excited. You know, I'm fucking, excuse me. I, I don't, I don't want to leave. Yeah. Today you rolled in at like 5 a.m. Yeah, man. I couldn't sleep. So yeah. I feel like I'm wasting time just sitting at the house. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, well, I'm just yep. late here. Might as well go do something. Yeah. And yeah. you know what? Yeah. We've been on a roll of uh, amazing guests. And I've been, my our guest today is Mr. Mark. Uh, is it Vital? Vital. Vital. I mean, see, like we're, we're, see, we're, I mean, I'm of Mexican descent. I'm like Vital. And <laughs> we start throwing in extra vowels. Uh, but I, we met, and I was like, how do I get this guy on the podcast? And then we kind of kept coming around in, in each other's circles. And then finally we went to the gala, and I was like, let me make the hard ask now. Put a little pressure. Uh, and I knew you wanted to come on, and uh, I appreciate your time. So why don't you give us a high-level view of, uh, you know, who is Mark? Yeah, no problem, man. No, I appreciate it. Yeah, we've been playing tag for a minute trying to get on here. <laughs> so, uh, oh shit, grew up in Washington State. Joined the Marine Corps back in 98. It's funny because, like, I'll be talking to people. I'm like, well, see, back in my day, I joined the military in the 1900s. Yeah. <laughs> Makes you sound that's a little crazy. crazy. <laughs> isn't it? That's, cra that's crazy the to even think about. Right? Yeah. Oh, man. That's crazy. Yeah. And it's true. Oh, you turned yeah. the century bets. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, uh, joined the military, joined the Marine Corps, ended up re enlisting right after 9 11. Went to Okinawa for a year, came back. My last unit got deployed to Iraq in 2004, uh, back to, or to Najaf, I should say. Then came out, came back February 05, got out in 06. And it was like, as soon as I came home, it was, it was all downhill. I'm talking half a bottle of rum a night just to sleep, mm. function, not go running out of banks and hide under my couch anymore. Um, and like after all that, it just it, it downfall, like divorce. Like it's funny. They make that joke on Facebook. If you've got three out of these things, you know, divorce, might, bad might be a veteran. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, shit, I'm, I epitomize all these yeah. things. <laughs> Do I get extra credit if I have all of them? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I was an overachiever. Yeah. You know, so. Well, let's talk about what brought you into the service because I think it's interesting for us. I mean, Raul and I are both post 9 11 vets, right? So there's this big call to action. You know, we have this big event in our lives. Uh, so what was it about the military that brought you in, especially coming from Washington? Um, I guess, like, growing up out in the woods, you know, I'm used to playing around, running around, doing all that stuff outside, so I was active, and then I had a couple of buddies that joined the Marine Corps, they ended up getting me down to the recruiter station, they showed me all the moto videos of doing, like, urban <laughs> assault, they come out of the woods, breach doors, and they're just, like, kicking ass, taking names, I'm like, oh, that looks awesome, I want in. They got them. Yeah. They got me. Yeah. <laughs> the, high, the high video is what did it. It is. It totally is. And then, well, we'll, you know, travel this guy's been to 33 countries he's like in a security force job and doing all this other craziness i'm like dude i'm in and then i went to lejeune yeah so that was kind of a letdown but uh yeah it was totally the hype videos yeah and i had a great recruiter he was really good at talking he didn't bullshit me i, I will say that he was totally honest he's like this is gonna suck but you're good you got this don't worry <laughs> <laughs> I, so I got a I got a couple questions. So you enlisted in '98. Mm -hmm. Where were you September 11, 2001? Uh, I was on Camp Lejeune. I was at Swim Qual, right? So Swim Qual, if you go through the morning and you keep progressing through the levels, I forget how they progress it up. You do like the basic stuff in the morning, and then if you pass all that, you come back in the afternoon and you go higher to like WSQ or whatever. We'd gone through, most of us were done by lunch. So in my mind, I'm like, dude, I got a half day off. 
talk to my guys. And as a corporal, I'm like, look, we go back to the barracks, stay quiet, stay in the room, <laughs> stay out of sight. Famous last words, stay man. Good. Bro, yeah. we're going to go, you know, we got a half day off. We're going to be good. <laughs> I get back to the barracks and I go by my buddy Rusty's room. And he's yelling about World War III. I'm like, man, are you crazy? I'm like, all right. So I go in there and I look, look on the TV, I see a plane hit the World <sighs> Trade Center. I'm like, dude, this is a jacked up movie. What are you, what are you watching? And I look in the bottom and it said CNN. Heart dropped. I'm like, oh, shit. All right. Everybody got everybody. I said, haul ass back to the ramp. Let's go. So everybody gets down there. And it's like just total chaos. The whole base goes into lockdown. Yeah. Force recon's already lined up, waiting on buses, like within an hour. And just after that, it was just, I don't know. It was crazy. Yeah. Everything just went from like all relaxed atmosphere to oh shit we just got attacked and now it's just insane the security measures were nuts yeah every every time i hear somebody's story of of their 9-11 experience man it gives me chills yeah. like like it's like shit mm -hmm. you know and and we were talking about it the other day is is the 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 recruits joining the military now weren't even born when that happened right? <laughs> <laughs> I know. yeah yeah yeah, it's insane. But I, I also I feel like it's in, it's important for us to talk about. It is, you know, like it is. you know, it's, everyone's like, oh, we got to remember, we got to remember. Like, well, a better way to ask than where were you? Uh, and it's like still fresh in our minds because it's like, so much has happened since then uh, for us as adults now. <laughs> yeah, I'll never forget that, man. It's like it, I could flash back into it, and I don't remember what I did yesterday, but I can flash mm -hmm. back into that. <laughs> yeah, sir. <laughs> So how did uh, how many years did you do total with the Marines? Eight, eight years, and what's like one outstanding memory besides? I mean, obviously nine eleven is pretty big, but like mm. any huge accomplishments, you're like, man, this was really cool. That's a tough one. Mm -hmm. So I was a mechanic with LAR. I don't know if y'all know what LAVs are—an eight wheel tank, like a wheeled Bradley or whatever, basically. Mm -hmm. um, like they let us shoot the main gun sometimes. They actually let me. One of the mortar shoots I went on, they actually let me start dropping mortars. Um, of course, that one, we almost got blown up by F-18s. So that was, that kind of stood out a little bit. Um, I don't know. It wasn't like a big, illustrious career. I did four years on Lejeune. Uh, went to Okinawa for a year. That was awesome. I worked on the rifle range, but Okinawans like Hawaii is to us. So it was a nice, tiny island. We have these crystal clear blue waters. Actually, so here's my favorite story. We used to snorkel all the time. Snorkel and spearface. We'd go run down, just you know, enjoy the day. My buddy comes running down to my room one day. He's like, dude, 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 grab all your snorkel stuff. There's a 20-foot great white shark off Kin Red. Same spot we always go. There's a pier that goes like maybe a quarter mile out into the water. He's like, let's go find this thing. I'm like, yes, that's a great idea. <laughs> Fucking Marines, <laughs> bro. <laughs> so, yeah. Oh, shit. Shit. <laughs> so we grab everything. We haul us down to the beach, get out to the end of the pier, put everything on, dive around. And we're cutting grits, grits, trying to find this thing. All right, where's it at? Where's it at? Three hours we swam around, never found it. Probably a good thing. Yeah. Not saying we were the brightest. <laughs> <laughs> it's just... I don't know that story because I still laugh at him today because that was back in 02. Wow. Yeah. That's hilarious. Yeah. Yeah. Let's go find a shark. Yeah. Hey. It's brilliant. I, I expect <laughs> nothing else. <laughs> <laughs> so when you got out of the Marines, you went back home to Washington? Actually, no. I moved to Phoenix. Oh, wow. Yeah. When were you there? I was going to go to school to UTI and to get certified as a civilian car mechanic and just transfer all the skills over. Um, ended up not going to school. I got a job as an apprentice as a diesel mechanic, worked my way up through journeyman and all that stuff, and then just kind of, I guess you could say, started a life but really screwed it up because I, was, I got married. 11 months later, I left her. We got divorced, and I spiraled even worse with the drinking. I was in motorcycle clubs, so... My whole focus was riding around and drinking, and, mm -hmm. and I didn't care about anything else. I wasn't responsible. I, yeah, so just the whole life spiraled out of control. I was living with people. I didn't have anything saved up. I'd make de decent money as a diesel mechanic, but that just means I could buy that much more liquor that weekend. And it was. I'm glad it happened. It's interesting to look back on and realize how I was 
But on the same note, it's like almost shameful that I did all this. Right. I screwed up so much. And it's like, well, all right, whatever. It's part of me. It's history. It's a fact. It happened. I can't change it. So, all right. So I ended up working random jobs, haven't kept jobs, always had issues with them or something to where I'd quit, get fired or you know, craziness. Um, ended up in culinary school. So I was like, all right, well, starting to get a little bit more. How'd you go from diesel mechanic to culinary school? Oh, dude, I went from diesel mechanic to building custom chain link and rod iron fences to culinary school. Shit. Yeah. I just want to touch everything, huh? Oh, yeah. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah. I always loved cooking. I've always wanted to go. And it was just like, after being a decent mechanic, my body hurt. Yeah. 27, 28 years old. Can't sit up in the morning because my back's killing me. So I'd roll out of bed and kind of slide around until I could get moving. Um, and I just had enough of it. So I was like, yeah, I'll go make money cooking. You don't make money cooking. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's good now because I eat really well. Yeah. But I mean, that's about it. Um, and then after school, I ended up going to the Grand Canyon, ended up becoming the sous chef up there. So that was my first real job after culinary school, making 1075 an hour as a sous chef. Wow. <laughs> no money. Mm -hmm. Great experience. No money. Uh, my dad died the day before I graduated and I was like, all right, cool. I'm going to move back home. And it was just one of those things I felt I had to do. So I ended up moving back home after that summer at the Grand Canyon. I cooked some more. Here we go again. Job changing. Um, I worked masonry, uh, like a hod carry. So I'd mix mud and pack bricks for them. Basically, I was just a little freaking gopher. Gopher. <laughs> yeah. Um, I did some excavating. Same thing. Running the rakes, running the shovels, the gopher. I got into the shipyard, and I was welding on nuclear ships and subs on the Navy stuff. And that was great, right? And like I'd had one DUI back in 2010 in Phoenix and that didn't phase me. I didn't care. And I screwed up more and got extended with the interlock and it just whatever. So it took me two years to get this job with the shipyard. And I was like, I'm here. I made it. This is what everybody does. You got the federal job. You got the benefits. You got the pay. It's great. And I just, I could never picture myself there and I didn't know why. Well, fast forward to. So what year is this again? That was 2016. All right. Um, so this is probably, what would you, what would you say, um, like an eight, nine, ten year journey after transition out? Yeah, because I was out in 06. Mm -hmm. So then 06 till 13, I was in Phoenix. Mm -hmm. And then after that's when I moved. Um, right. So you got this job now, federal job. Yeah, loved it. I was a welder. Like, absolutely loved it. Um, the, what was it um, Christmas time of 2016? Like I knew I've been drinking too much. I'm like, man, I gotta slow down. I know I have to, because I'm the type that's like, all right, I'm not gonna drink this week. You know, it's it's getting too bad, and I'd make it till Wednesday. I'm like, yes, I did so good. I'm gonna celebrate. Have a drink. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> all over again. Um, I ended up going down to Phoenix, going to meet more friends, hung out with them over the holidays. We were golfing with one of my buddies, and there was another guy that always hung out with us as well. And we were talking about him. We're like, man, we should have called him. He should have come out. Well, the next morning, my buddy calls me that I went golfing with. He's like, hey, Eric shot himself last night. Oh, man. And I was like, screw it. <clears throat> Straight back down in the bottle. Um, two months later, I got my second DUI. And it's, fu it's, it's not funny. It's more ironic because the weekend before, I was drinking in the same bar. I had a car that was straight pipe. It was old school, 300 with the heavy, and I was doing 135 through the back roads of Washington. So this weekend, I was like, cool, I'm going to beat it. <laughs> uh, yeah, smart. <laughs> Leaving a bar drunk, trying to get 150 is not genius. I get up to the top of the hill after I leave this bar. So it's a mile-long hill. There's a cop sitting right here. I was like, oh, he got me. So I just slowed down. I'm like, whatever, dude, I'll get a ticket. Probably no big deal. He catches up, pulls me over, does a whole drunk test. I failed miserably. Um, so he arrests me, gives me the DUI, does all this stuff, and then he lets me go. He drops me off at the uh, gas station like 2.30 in the morning. I'm like, well, huh, car's impounded. 
oh, my buddy's awake. So I start making phone calls. It takes me about a half hour to get someone to wake up, come pick me up, and I crashed at his house. And I woke up the next day, just remembering, I'm like, I, it, it hit me how bad I just screwed up again. Because with that federal job that took me almost two years to get, they don't tolerate DUIs and dumb stuff. And I was like, oh, all right, starting to get freaked out. Go to court, I get accepted into the deferred prosecution. So it's two years alcohol counseling, two years probation, and two years sober support. All, right. all this is expensive. <laughs> We're talking court mandated stuff. Oh, man. It's yeah, it, it is. It adds up. And it's a lot of work. So I'm like, all right, I'm getting all this done. It's a full time job, man. It is too. Yeah. Like, so you got the full time job already, but now you have to do all this extra stuff. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm like, all right, I'm doing everything right. We're good. I'm, I'm not going to lose my job. I self reported. Like, I went in that Monday and I was like, hey, look, I screwed up. I got a DUI. I was very upfront first thing in the morning on Monday. Um, so we're starting to work with them. And then as everything come out through the court system, they're like, all right, well, this, this, and this. We can't allow you to continue. So here's what we're going to do. We'll give you two options. We can fire you so you can get Social Security or unemployment, sorry. Mm -hmm. Or we can put down you resign for personal reasons and you can come back and reapply and probably get hired in a year. I was like, you know what? Let's just put down resign for personal reasons. And that was probably the hardest moment knowing that after all this was said and done, I'd screwed up enough to where I finally lost this job to where I thought that's where I was supposed to be. Mm -hmm. That's where I was supposed to retire. And then I was lost. I'm like, I don't know what the hell I'm going to do anymore. Um, ended up. What year is this again? Sorry, I'm just trying to oh, get a timeline. That was 2017. Oh, okay. So I got the. Feels like it's not that long ago, but. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right? It's crazy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was probably April 2017. I got wow. Fired. Yeah. So how long were you there at the federal job before this happened? Mm, 14 months. Yeah. It goes back to the whole. Uh, timeline of not keeping jobs very well. Mm -hmm. um, ended up getting another job shortly after I had to sell my house and pay off everything. I was going to go to lineman school, but then you know, probation, all that got in the way. Couldn't do that. Got a different job. Worked that for another year and a half. So I was 18, brings me up to 20. Um, February of 21, or actually earlier than that, in 2020, my buddy had started a nonprofit down here with sailing for, you know, bringing vets out sailing. And he'd been trying to get me down here forever. Hey, dude, let's go sailing. I'm like, I'm not an old rich white guy. I, that, that, I'm not me. That's not me. I, I don't sail. Um, finally convinced me to fly down from Washington State. So I hung out for the weekend. We went sailing. And on the second day coming back, it was, it just hit me. I'm not angry. I'm not anxious. I was like, oh, dude, this is. You get that feeling that this is where I need to be. And I looked at them and I was like, oh, just had this realization. I'm like, you know, I'm just going to sell everything and move down here now. This is where I need to be. I'm going to help you all out. <laughs> they looked at me like cross-eyed at first. I'm like, no, no, seriously, it's it's going to happen. So the house is already getting ready to go on the market. I get rid of the apartment, walk away from the job, and let's do this. So that was February of 21. May of 21 was the first time that I made it down here with the first load of stuff. I'm like, hey, Taylor, what's up, man? Here's my stuff. I'm flying home to grab the rest. I'll see you in a few weeks. So I ended up <laughs> moving down here, uh, bought a condo, been sailing, and just kind of doing that ever since. Wow. <laughs> and how, how did you know Taylor before? Uh, I didn't. Um, one of my buddies I was stationed with started oh, okay. a profit with him. Got you. That's, that's the buddy. Yeah. Yeah, so it's been... It's been a wild ride to get me here, but it's like, now that I'm here, it's where I'm supposed to be. Mm. So what's, what's like an overall lesson that you really learned about your transition? I mean, clearly I can say that you were unprepared <laughs> Yes, <laughs> because I can say that about me, like <laughs> still unprepared, you yeah. know, uh, but what's something that, that when, uh, you know, when vets are getting a retransition that you like to tell them, Hey, look, look out for this or do this. You know, it, it's trying to get them to understand to where you really need to prepare and have some sort of plan or some sort of idea to get you on the right track with a job or with money, housing, all that. Because I got out and I'm just like, I don't know what the hell we're going to do. We're just going to rent a house. All right, so we rented a house. What are we doing? I don't know. I'm gonna, I guess I'm going to try to get a job. So definitely get some sort of plan together. 
I got it. <laughs> no, you're good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Keep doing that. I'm like, ah. You know, and we had, I think that's a cultural <laughs> thing too, because we had, uh, you know, Dr. Jones came on and she talked about how her family, um, and her mom worked at GM, I believe, Ventures for years, right? Mm -hmm. Years. So did you have someone in your family that was the same way? Like, hey, my, if I, I can go get a job and work there for 20 years. And that's how I. That was at the shipyard in Washington State. Right. My dad had worked there and retired. And like, I'd known all his friends around there, the same thing. They'd worked mm -hmm. there and retired. So that was kind of, that's what it was like when I moved back to Washington. That was what you did. Yeah. And then the, the, the change, the exposure to the sea was like, yeah. oh, <laughs> I'm Mind supposed blowing. to be over here. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That, man, that's crazy. But so you, you've been sober how long? Today's six years, one month, 17 days. How does it feel to say that, man? Amazing. I never thought I'd go a week without drinking, let alone over six years now. I'm not... It changes your entire mindset, which I'm, you all know. You don't look at it like, oh, I'm going to go drink tonight. Then you wake up and you're like, oh, this sucks. I'm not doing it today. And then you get the anxiety. Um, it's more, oh, yeah, I don't care about, like, I'm older now. I'm not saying I'm old. I'm, you know, <laughs> got a few years on me. Um, it's like 9 o'clock at night. My buddy's like, hey, dude, we're going out. I'm like, oh, it's 9. It's late. <laughs> <laughs> I get up in the morning. I go to the gym. <laughs> Yeah, I, I I know what you feel, man. Uh, that shit, I have trouble staying up, trying to stay up for these UFC fights, man. I'm like, oh. man, I'm, but it's funny, like I I'll stay up any other night, but when it's something I want to do, I'm just like, oh, you can't do it. Yeah, Yanni, man. So uh, six years is an incredible accomplishment, and you know, with if you could go back and tell day one, Mark something, what would it be? Mm. you decided okay now it's time the struggling alcoholic right now is is watching what is your message to him that that's probably a better question that yeah. question that yeah basically it would have to be it's gonna suck if you don't do this now if you gotta learn the hard way <laughs> you're not gonna like it yeah if i could go back and just make myself understand and that's, that would probably be the biggest thing. Understand where life was headed and how bad I had like messed things up. If I could put that and like beat it through, like, you know, the ghost of Christmas past, but like, here's, here's what's going to happen if you don't. And I could show myself stuff like that and then be like, dude, you need to stop. Yeah. And then make sure I understood that I can with the right mentality and the motivation. That's, I think, would be the biggest thing. It's just like, dude, you need to stop right now. Ghost of, a ghost of Christmas past. Yeah. I've never heard it like that, but that, I like that the way it's. Uh, yeah. Yeah, man. Yeah. It's um, it's an incredible feeling, man. And and a lot of people, I mean, we don't we don't preach it, mm -hmm. you know. But if somebody was interested in in learning and doing it, by all means, we're like, hey, here, let's let's help you. Mm -hmm. But you know, like we always say, is we can't. We can't do 80% of the work. We can't do 90% of the work. It's, it's, it's that person that wants to get clean and sober has to do 98% of the work. And yep. we're just here to pat you on the butt and tell you good job. You yeah. know. Yeah, I, I, don't, I don't think we bring it up a lot on the show, but we definitely talk about it outside the show. Yeah. You know, not on, maybe not on air as much, but when we have guests like you to, to be able to pick their brain a little bit more about it, it's because when I go – to these different events like networking events and i'm like do y'all have anything that's non-alcoholic you know are you going to have anything that's available because does everything have to be centered around alcohol do we have to provide free alcohol like you know because we've talked about doing events and having stuff and it's like no not, alcohol is not a thing that we're going to offer i, yeah. I just well, good. It's, it's like we always say we try to normalize sobriety normalize being clean because if you you think about it how many veteran events have you gone to where there was no alcohol yeah zero <laughs> no yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and it's such a big factor mm -hmm. to like compound all of the issues that we're dealing with it is and it just makes it worse too and then the next day you get like if you're like me i would get the massive anxiety attack about i feel like crap i can't get out of bed and i'm being unproductive and i'd make myself fall into that and not even try yeah but yeah like you're saying man it's so hard 
Like it took me four years before I even tried a non-alcoholic beer. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And it's like going to events now. I'm like, this is, okay, do you have any NA beers? And if they say no, I'm like, cool, just give me a water. And it's still tough. Oh, man, it's still tough. There's yeah. been a lot of times like I'm like, you know what? I made it this long. I can have one. And I'm like, really? <laughs> yeah. No, no. I slap myself. And I'm like, that's how it starts, man. Yep. Yeah. That yeah. is the worst thing to say to myself. Mm-hmm. I literally, I'm like, dude, you're dumb. Don't, don't even think about it. Because I know where I was, and I'm not going back down there. Too so, of a spot. so what's something that you remind yourself when you do find yourself in that situation? You're like, um, for me, I always think about my my mission, right? Like, and, and how I used to feel waking up hungover. It's that the empty bank account mm. after, a day after being paid, um, just the. Uh, I guess I don't know if you could say shame, but shame of. Okay, now I went this long. I've accomplished this much being sober. Why am I going to throw that away now? That's it, man. Yeah, I'm, man. I was that thinking that streak, same, bro. I was thinking that same thing, right? bro. I was like, you know, in a way, it kind of feels funny because I'm like, I feel like a lot of people depend on me mm-hmm. and and look look up to what we're doing, even if they're not. I feel that way. Yeah. And then I'm like, to to me, to have to say, damn, I got a new clean and sober date. Mm-hmm. I think that would be a mind trip for me. And I, I just, I can't do it. So I'm like, you know, I, I wouldn't. Man, I'm glad you brought that up. Cause I've actually had buddies. They're like, dude, I just quit drinking. I'm 30 days sober, 45 days sober. And they're like, I saw that if you could do it, man, I could do it. Yeah. yeah. And that's like the biggest thing for me. I'm like, holy shit. I did something good. Yeah. You know, cause <laughs> coming from my whole life, dude, I've jacked everything up and now I'm doing something good. So it just feels amazing. It's crazy, isn't it? It is. And then it's crazy to think that what you've accomplished in those six years. Mm-hmm. And then you think, damn, what if I would have quit 10 years ago? <laughs> right? <laughs> Where would uh-huh. I be now? Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, yeah, man. I have these same thoughts. I was thinking the same thing because we're talking about I'm coming up on four years in June, man. And I'm like, man, we got a studio. You know, like we have successful businesses. We're entrepreneurs. Like, not me. I was a, I was a, you know, I was damn. Uh-huh. Yeah. It's just, it's just crazy to think. It's crazy to think like, oh man, I did this in almost four years. Shit. What's going to happen in the next four years? Yeah. Yes. Or what would have happened if I would have got cleaner four years before this, you know? But a lot of people, a lot of people tell me like, it's, 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 you wouldn't have learned the lessons you've learned. Mm-hmm. You wouldn't have learned the struggle and you wouldn't have learned like you needed those hard headed lessons. Yes. People always ask me, like, hey, you know, like when they ask you, how do you learn life lessons? Of course, you, you say the hardest fucking way possible. <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> yeah. That's exactly yeah. what it is. <laughs> we just had this conversation the other day. It's like, you know, I think the only reason I'm good at helping other veterans is because I have jacked up. Yeah. yeah. I have screwed up so much. And it's like, look, dude, I've been there. This is what I did. This is what happened. Here's how I want you know, to help you. If you want it, cool. I got you. If not, well, then you know this is what's going to happen. But yeah. but it makes you relatable. Mm-hmm. It makes you somebody's more going to take information and knowledge from you than the the guy not doing what you're doing. You yeah. know what I mean? Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. Exactly. yeah. So I, and that, that's remarkable, man. I I see it. I see the passion in your eyes and your face when you're speaking, and and that's that's dope, man. Yeah. So what do you tell um, a veteran who is interested in sailing? Oh, dude. Well, what are the, some of the benefits of sailing? It will actually, like, we start with, like, the day sales and overnight sales. Just a quick intro on Galveston Bay, and then we go offshore. But it gets you out there. It gets you in back in that team, right? So you miss your fire team. You miss your squad from the military. This gets you back into that mentality, working with team, working with all vets again. And you have a job and a purpose. So when you're... When you get out on the boat and you're actually working together, it's like everything else goes away and you go back to that old mindset and you see people really come out of their shell. So I'll tell them, I'm like, hey, dude, here's my card. Call me. Phone number, email. You can go through the website, whatever. Get in contact with us. We'll get you on the boat. <laughs> um, but you can physically see a change in them. Yeah. Like they'll come out unsure. Like, you know, okay, you, know, you don't know what you're getting into. And it's like, eh, it's sailing. It can't be that fun. And you'll see them, they're like, all right, kind of look around, 
they might have a bad day, slump down, be depressed, whatever. You start getting everybody out there with some wind, you get to work in the sails and you turn off the engine, you're sailing. And then everybody starts you know, perking up. And then now the military humor comes out because every branch is making fun of each other, <laughs> taking jabs <laughs> at each other. Like, oh, well, come on. Why can't you do this, puss? And, yeah. And then that's when you really see like their faces light up. They'll start laughing, having fun, natural conversation flows. We've had people come down from Arkansas sail for a weekend and they ended up talking about stuff they never talk about. They hit that spot to where they felt safe and comfortable. They're on a boat with all vets with their brothers and sisters. And then now all this stuff just flows naturally. So between the ocean, the teamwork, and then having that network, it just, it's healing. It's therapeutic, man. Man, I could, I could picture it. I could, I could, I can see that. And it brings back to camaraderie, the, the friendship, the memories, the the good, the bad. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. And it's like Taylor always says, that's the slowest adrenaline rush you'll ever have. <clears throat> I mean, the fastest you're going to go out on the bay, we had it up to like eight knots. So for a sailboat, a 38 footer that we use, that's hauling. Right. So it's like nine, 10 miles an hour. Okay. So it's slow, <laughs> but you're healed over, you're going, you feel the power. It's windy and everybody's having a blast. So it's, it gets your adrenaline going. And then it helps, because I don't know if y'all know, like, how PTSD affects the brain, shrinks mm -hmm. the hippocampus and all this stuff. This one, when you do an adrenaline rush, or any adventure therapy, really, it replaces the bad memories with good memories. But it also helps your hippocampus actually regrow. So instead of staying in that fight or flight mode, now it's starting to regrow to where you only hit that when you need to. So it starts getting less and less. And you don't have these big massive anxiety attacks out in town. So why don't you dig into that a little bit more? I'd like to hear, um, if you have it, uh, some of the science behind that uh, with the PTSD and the, um, or how deep can you really go. Give me, just give us a broad scale what that actually means. Uh, basically, it's like you go to combat, right? Mm -hmm. You live on this adrenaline rush. You're always looking for what's going to happen next. Right. Your brain physically adapts. So the hippocampus, the hippocampus prefrontal cortex, all this, they shrink. And instead of having the ability to be like, oh, okay, that's not a threat. It's okay. And you're kind of making logical decisions. It's a snap decision because it's combat. Someone's shooting at you. So you've got to know right now, are we fighting or are we running? Um, once your brain goes through that long enough, that's how it stays. And until you do something to, I guess, take yourself out of there and regrow it or go through the counseling and trying to do therapy or something, uh, you're going to stay there the rest of your life. I don't know the full science, on, right? But um, yeah, I'm definitely not That's, a doctor. Yeah, <laughs> what? So, I know, I know. It, it's shocking. <laughs> That's the one job I haven't done. Yeah. <laughs> Pretty much. <laughs> so no, nah, okay. I went to two weeks of medical right. school. I'm good for surgery <laughs> too. I saw Doogie Howser, man. Yeah, I'm a doctor. So, <laughs> so high level view when we're in combat, uh, you know this this part of our brain, the front part, is such uh, new, right? Mm -hmm. So it starts to shut off, and then we kind of go back to that primal instincts where you're making when you're getting your adrenaline, you're making reactions and decisions faster mm -hmm. because we are in combat. Yep. And so when you introduce something like adventure therapy, what does that do? You said it slows it down. So it takes the adrenaline rush. So it's similar to combat. You're still getting that rush. You're still getting, hey, we got to do things right now. But you're taking out the bad memories and replacing them with good memories. Mm -hmm. So as you're doing that, now your brain's processing everything different. So it's not a bad thing. It's a good thing. And somehow it regrows it. Okay. Know if it's, got yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's the magic of brain. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we'll man, I'm that. telling you, right? <laughs> I'm telling you, it's amazing. <laughs> Yeah, man. It's... And so what are some other forms of adventure therapy? I mean, I know you guys specialize in, in sailing, mm -hmm. um, but what are some other ways that vets can, can introduce this? Uh, shoot. You can go skydiving, camping, um, riding horses, equine therapy. That's yeah, amazing. yeah, yeah. That's a big one, ain't it? It is. Yeah. It is. They got some big ones. We we got a scuba diving. Oh, yeah. That was another one. Yes. We had a another organization that was on here talking about that so so tell us more about the skeleton crew man what what it's dope i like the name <laughs> right yeah. yeah so taylor started in 2016 when he got out of the navy uh, he was a rescue swimmer um, 
all his friends started to commit suicide because of all the stuff they'd seen and been through. Um, he was trying to figure out how to stop this. So he created a skeleton crew. He's like, I'm going to sail around Cape Horn and he's going to get as many vets involved as he can. Get a vet involved in something, they get a purpose, mm -hmm. they're less likely to commit suicide. Yeah. So he did this two year epic journey, made a documentary about it, and got as many people as he could involved. Um, started Tequila Company, and then that's been slowly in the works. It's finally coming out now to help fund Skeleton Crew because he got back and he's like, all right, well, we did this. That was the first step. Second step is making our nonprofit. Third step, how do we fund it? So he's got the tequila company, start skeleton crew sailing. Um, 2019 linked up with the other guy. They came and uh, they came together to make one and they started working together. <laughs> Excuse me. And then shoot, the rest is history, man. Yeah. Sailing on Galveston Bay. <clears throat> we actually just got back from the British Virgin Islands. What? <laughs> yeah. And y'all y'all got a big adventure coming up, right? Yeah. So we just bought a Swan 51, a 51-foot sailboat. We went down there to Tortola. That's where we bought the boat. We worked on it and then sailed it back. So it took us a little longer than expected. We hit, you know, bad winds and the Gulf Stream or no wind. So it took us two weeks to come back 2,000 miles, which, all right, you know, Long trip, whatever. What, back. What's average? Um, everything that we had done for route route and weather planning was nine days. Okay, okay. <laughs> Shit, yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. Whoops. Yeah. So we, we hit a couple of wrong spots. But that's all right. Um, so we brought that back, and we're going to get into a refit. But June 15th, we're heading up to New Hampshire to have our going away party to shoot across the pond because this year we're doing the Ocean Globe race. 27,000 nautical miles, seven month race, all celestial navigation, no electronics. Bro, that's crazy. Yes. <laughs> like, and we, celestial means stars, right? Yep. I'm not the only one that. Yes. Right. Yeah. I was going to Google it later. <laughs> <laughs> what was the word he said? <laughs> yeah. So you yeah. see the old pictures of guys holding all these, doing this stuff on the boat, trying to take readings. They're actually measuring where the sun and stars and all this stuff are at. They do all these calculations. You're going to do the Moana? You're going to be able to put your hand up? Yeah, I'm like, That's oh, how you do oh it. no, we're off. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, we're, we're going completely around the world doing this. We're the only American team, only crew of all veterans, and we're doing another documentary. They've already started showing, like, they know that adventure therapy works for PTSD. Um, they have one, one bill that's been passed already for, like, outdoor therapy. So we're going to lobby to... Let's get it implemented in the military after deployment. You know, you get it at a source. You come back from deployment. It's like the British guys already do. You know, Israelis and a bunch of other. They already in, implemented it. So they have a lot less veteran suicides. If we catch this right after deployment and you get that two to three week decompression and you get yourself, you know, off the, uh, I guess, the, the bad memories, you know. Yeah. And, and you get yourself before you start hitting the really low spots, then you won't have as hard time transitioning out. You won't have all the issues of PTSD mm -hmm. or won't be as bad. So that's our, that's our main goal for that. Man. So, so seven months, you said seven months. Seven, that's it, just the race is seven months. Oh, dang. It's going to take us cause we're leaving in June. Race starts in September. So we're going to be sailing a couple months prior to, and then another trip home be another two months. So ideally, or theoretically, I guess I should say, I'll be gone at least a year. Wow. <laughs> yeah. That's crazy. Now, I know, man. right? I'll be living on the boat in the next year. Yeah. yeah. So we'll see you in a year and a half. <laughs> yeah. yeah. For the follow up. Yep. Dang. Man, I don't know. I don't know. You don't get cooped up? Like, feel like you're just mm. stuck there? Not really. Mm -hmm. Because you're always doing something. You have a job to do. Yeah. Okay. Um, I mean, the longest trip I've done besides just like boat deliveries was this last two weeks. And it was just, it got to be normal. It's your daily routine. <laughs> so there's going to be times to where I'm like, all right, dude, I'm tired of you. Go to the front of the boat. Get away from me. Yeah. <laughs> but, and it's broken up in the legs. You're, we're only going to be on the boat for probably 45, 50 days at a time. Okay. In between ports. So we'll actually get to see a bit of the world as well. That's good. Wow. Man. Yeah. Yeah. That's, That's amazing. amazing. Yeah. Take him. <laughs> right. I don't think you can do it without Shit, me, bro. No, I couldn't. Yeah. Not, 
more than a week, maybe. Yeah, you come back, this place will be on fire. I missed you. <laughs> no, you left me without supervision. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, man. So what's uh what's been the the most pressing issue for vets that you've seen come on the on the boat that they need help with? Oh, definitely PTSD. The anxiety and the depression. I hear everybody else talking about how they get stuck at home, and I'm like, dude, I know it sucks. I still like I still gotta deal with it, but it's not as bad. I'm like, this is, you know, text somebody, start something small, you know, text or call or hey, go for a walk get out in the sun, walk around the neighborhood. That'll help you feel better. Mm. Now you don't feel so I don't know, cramped up, cooped. Um, and besides, being out in the sun helps you feel better anyway, the vitamin D and all that stuff. Yeah. Man. So you think that's like the, the biggest pressing issue that vets are dealing with, like just the ability to get reconnected or um, that's almost dealing with it on their own? I think so. That because – if they're like me, I'm not going to admit anything's wrong. <laughs> yeah. I'm not going to ask for help because fuck you, I'm a Marine. I'm good. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but it, it, there's that stigma throughout the military. You don't ask for help. You're going to seem weak. Well, if you don't, you're going to keep screwing up over and over. I mean, prime example, look at me, you know, two DUIs, divorce, bad credit. I mean, I've done everything. Um, but yeah, you got to do something. You can't just sit there. Because that's the worst thing, because then your mind spins out of control. Then you're like, why am I here? Well, you know, I'm tired of being here. I don't want to be here anymore. Well, I'm going to turn myself off. So if you can start with those little steps, the little victories every day, like there's that book, Make Your Bed. You know, the, mm -hmm. what was that? Uh, McCraven. Yeah. So like I still do it every day. I'm like, I make my bed. So now I walk into my room and I'm like, cool. It doesn't look like crap because I didn't make my bed. And I have that one thing I've done. And I'm like, all right, well, I'm going to do something else. You, know, you start with small stuff and get going. Man, uh, I'm, I'm excited. You definitely got to come back. I'm excited to, to hear. Y'all going to be posting things on will you okay. on social media, things like that? So we won't be doing it while we're on the water. <clears throat> right, right, we right. can't have anything and there's no service. Um, we will be doing What? There's no service in the middle of the water? I know. <laughs> I know. It's crazy. <laughs> Um, Come on, Elon. Yeah, <laughs> the is. Oh, yeah. There's uh, we got a couple of different groups that are going to be posting for us. We're going to do photo dumps at every port. So we'll have all our guys posting. We'll be sending out a couple of our sponsors like Greencastle and Sig Sauer. They're going to post for us. They're going to push it out. Um, you'll be able to, I believe, on the website, OceanGlobeRace.com. You'll be able to follow us. Maybe I'm still trying to figure out where exactly. It might be another app that you use, but uh, definitely be a way to follow us and then through our social media and everybody else's. We're going to make sure it's widely known what we're doing. Man, let us know. We'd love to share that information. Yeah, that's right. amazing. And, and, and follow, follow the, the journey, man. Yeah. So what is, what is, uh, sailing taught you about yourself? Oh man. I've got all the questions there. No, they're good. I like good. it. I like yeah, it. Man. Me too. You can't prepare. It's, it's helped out my confidence a lot more. Because I used to be, like, when I was drinking, I always had confidence issues. I was running from my problems instead of being able to face them. And I just couldn't deal with it. Yeah. So as I've progressed through sobriety and sailing, it's like, I don't know why I was running from anything. This is ridiculous. I can do whatever now. So I feel like I'm talking to myself. <laughs> <laughs> right? But it, yeah. all, that's all the more power in it, though. Mm -hmm. You know, like, like if you're watching this somewhere and you've been thinking about going sober, man, let this be the episode. You're like, let me, let me give it a shot. Yeah. Let Ed Milet, just one more day, just mm -hmm. for one day. Just one, do it one, one day. day, just one, one day. day. Yeah. One more day. One turns into two. Do yeah. anything for one day. Yeah, man. Did you, did you work the steps? No, you just, it, fuck it. I tried. I tried the steps. I tried AA. It's not it, for everybody. It, it didn't work for me. Yeah. I was like, I just want to go drink now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Depressing. It's all right, cool. You're stuck in it. No, what it's true. Now? I know what you mean. <laughs> oh, did that say that? Yeah. I'm like, man, I come back and I'm like, man, these guys are depressing. Yeah. Right? But you know, so I, uh, I actually, I, w I went into an NA group, man. Mm -hmm. I don't. I'm, we're not supposed to talk, but anyway, so, so, and their stories were different, and and I, I felt like more okay. This is this yeah. is my this is my crew. Mm -hmm. You know, because it wasn't a bunch of old heads. It was it was yeah. younger people, and it was. It was things like that. But to hear like their stories 
It's 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 humbling, but you know you you know sometimes I walk out of there and I'm like, man, the fuck's wrong with that dude? <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> like, like, man, that was me. Yeah. <laughs> yep. that, that that guy's crazy. <laughs> dude, a lot of times I walk out of there. I am fucked up. Bro. Yeah. <laughs> and then, or you come out and be like, dang, my problems aren't as bad as that guy's. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> It'd be worse. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, man. Nah, that's that's incredible, man. You got a friend and a fan over here now, bro. Yeah, sure. And we're gonna yeah, be yeah. we're gonna be following. Oh yeah. And uh, keeping an eye on yeah. you. I wanna I wanna see. So when you get back, you'll be pushing close to what? Seven, eight years? Yeah, that would be probably yes. accurate, man. Seven and some change. Yeah, man. Definitely, we want to get you back on the show. Come out, man. Yeah, I would, I would love to, to yeah. hear the the progression, the journey, the everything. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, man. That's, that's dope, man. Congrats, <laughs> brother. Yeah, Thanks. I appreciate that. He's on. Hide, hide your, pull your shirt down, bro. What? I can, I can see how turned on you are. <laughs> oh. <laughs> <laughs> He's all looking at himself. So hey, I'm just messing with you. It's not oh, true. Shit. It's not true. I thought, I thought you were saying you saw my face. <laughs> <laughs> You're pitching a tent, bro. Yeah. Pitching a tent. <laughs> the bromance is real. Yeah. We're just talking about bromance. Bromance is real. That's crazy, man. Yeah. yeah. So how big is the crew that's going out to sale? So total we have... 13 ish. I got to double check the roster. Oh, wow. Each leg is eight to 10. So we'll get to a port. Like we're getting to from the UK where we start, we're going down to South Africa. We're going to swap out like one or two people. Then the next leg, we go all the way around to Auckland, New Zealand. Same thing. We'll switch out probably one or two people, go around Cape Horn to Uruguay and same thing. Um, But the average is going to be eight. The third leg where we go around Cape Horn, which is like the world's worst sailing, if you will. It's the Mount Everest for sailors it's gotcha. where the Pacific and the Atlantic meet. And it's like a storm with insane 70 foot waves every day. The perfect yeah, storm. Dog. Yeah. Really? That's the best movie. I have yeah. no idea. I've been trying to like research as much as I yeah. can. I'm like, man, it's going to be, it's going to be a lot. Um, cool. Yeah. Like, have I, you ever done that? Taylor has. Okay. okay. I have not. Yeah. Uh, very few people really sailed the Southern ocean. Um, just cause it's insane. It's an ocean. Yeah. <laughs> It's like a a nice calm day you got 20 30 foot waves wow yeah and like 30 knots of wind all right so for our listeners where is cape horn cape horn is in the very tip of south america okay yeah gotcha yeah, you didn't know that no i mean i, I didn't know that I didn't it's know like that. you know i'm like <laughs> geography that, i'm hey, like that, okay well that's you, another you thing i was gonna Uruguay. google <laughs> yeah. you said you to go i you know and i was like okay i, I can kind of see where they're going mm-hmm. now cape Horn is like where? <laughs> like ah, uh, okay, that makes sense. So, yeah. man, tell us a little bit about boat life, man. What's boat life living like? How was that? Is it like you're yeah? Like <laughs> 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 you're, you're healed over all the time, so you're leaning. Yeah, uh, it's do you, do you get off the boat and just <laughs> out no, of you, habit? You get yeah. off the boat and you stand there like this. <laughs> like it just rocking. happened to me i got off the boat i'm standing on the dock just going back and forth i'm like why am i moving <laughs> that's too funny man um it's it's weird because like everybody's got their jobs yeah whether you're a helmsman or a trimmer or the main or the jib or you know i'm gonna be cooking or something it's it's like a job but it's life so for me it just becomes routine right um it just becomes normal But the things you really got to work on are communication. Mm. Because like say me and you were out there sailing for a month and we're going to have an issue. We have to squash it right now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Got to be able to talk like adults and be like, that was jacked up. You know, can't do this, can't do that. And then figure it out. Otherwise, it's going to infect the entire crew. And then things are going to get south real quick. And it's going to be horrible. Yeah. So I see that. Okay. So you got to have the communication. Food. The biggest thing is like a good dinner once in a while, like not just all our canned and box stuff um, after a big storm or during something really shitty. If you get a hot meal that tastes mm. really good, you're just like, whatever, dude. Yeah. yeah. Go to bed. Try again in a couple hours. <laughs> <laughs> we'll be good. Um, but yeah, it's conservation. You know, you got to be really careful on how much water you use. 
how much food. I mean, you got storage and space issues. You figure it's 51 feet. We've got enough room for eight people, but eight people have all their stuff. And now we're going to have to have a place to dry stuff because we're going to stay cold, wet, and unhappy for 45 days at a time. Um, so it's just a lot of, I think the biggest thing is people skills. Yeah. Communication, getting along with people, making sure your crew's solid. How much, how much weight you drop in that 45, 50 days? Oh, shoot, dude. I just dropped like eight pounds in two weeks. So yeah, I'm probably going to come back with Ethiopian. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> we ain't even gonna recognize him. He's yeah, all help. beard. Oh, yeah, man. it's gonna be like cousin yeah. walking in. What's up, guys? Yeah. <laughs> Who the hell is that? Yeah. This guy. Oh man. Oh shit, man. Yeah. Great visual. It was. That's how all I'm picturing now. Yeah. Cool cousin Ed. Yeah. Well, that's amazing, man. I I really want to. Uh, so, how can folks keep in touch and follow and get involved with the Skeleton Crew or with you and your story? Uh, social media, man. We have Facebook and Instagram for Skeleton Crew Sailing. Um, our website is skeletoncrewadventures.org. I mean, there's you'll be able to network. You can find me on social media. Just look for Mark Vital. I'm always doing something stupid on Facebook. Like, hey, I'm on a boat. <laughs> it, never, it never gets, it never gets tiring. Huh? No, no, it doesn't. That's, that's, that's dope, man. I, I could, uh, I like, I enjoy some, some, some deep sea fishing, but I know I'm coming back like the same night. So I'm not, I'm not sure I'd feel about that. You know, you, do you have kids? I no. don't mean, oh, okay, okay. Nope. It's easy. Yeah. It's just me. Yeah, well, shit. Then maybe that that a whole a whole different aspect and mm-hmm. mindset for it. That wouldn't give a shit. It's like, let's go. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I'll tell you though, the sunrises and sunsets on a boat is so just phenomenal because it's nice, it's quiet, and you just get to sit there and enjoy the sun coming up or going down. Uh, my favorite watch is like nine p.m. to midnight. Sun's down. You got all the stars out, and it's just relaxing. Unless you're in a storm. And then, yeah, screw all that. It sucks. <laughs> <laughs> Everything goes out the window. If there's a storm, forget it. I hate yeah. it. <laughs> no. Um, but it's just, it's relaxing. It's calming. Like, and that's what got me. It was like, it calmed all my thoughts, all my anxiety. And I was just happy to be in the moment. Man, that's what's up. And it's like, also like reconnecting, you know, with the, the elements, the water and the gravitational pull and the wind. And it's like, heightened senses i can imagine it now mm-hmm. and i'm like you take you take that second to 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 just live for the moment right. and just you know the clarity the freshness the air mm-hmm. the the you know like i i was telling somebody the other day man like not until recently have i feel like i feel like my vision is better mm-hmm. i feel like i see things clearer Yep. And and I was like, man, sobriety, man, because like, right? I feel like uh, I'm enjoying life now, man. You know, I'm 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 content. I'm happy. Things are amazing. Things are happening. It's just the uh, there's no there's no limit, man. Yeah, you know. And uh, mm-hmm. I I love hearing other people's stories, man, because it's just it. Your story can help somebody else, mm-hmm. even if you don't know yeah. it. They might be like, oh shit. I, I experienced everything the same he did. Yep. And and this is the push they need. It is. And that's like, I put everything on social media now. I'm like, all right, I've gone through this, this, and this. All right, I've got my testosterone checked. I mean, uh, my testosterone level was 207. So your average range for your average male is 450 to like 1,200. So most vets are already down like 200. Yep. I've, I've found this out recently. Um you ideally want your levels right around 800 just to feel like a normal man. So that also helps out getting that back up there helps out kick the depression, all that stuff. Or like I was doing equine therapy and I'm posting about that. Look, this is what's helping me. I've hit the point to where it's like, you know what? I don't care what I look like anymore. This is what I'm doing. If it helps one or two people, good. That just verified and validated everything I've done. Yeah. If not, well then it helped me talk more. Because now, like I used to, I couldn't get up in front and talk in front of people at all. I didn't want to talk to anybody. I get anxiety calling my friends. I'm like, man, I can't do this. I don't want to talk. I'm going to text people. Now I'm like, I was just talking in front of 100 people freaking a couple weeks back. I go giving presentations to different clubs. It's like, I don't have a problem talking anymore. Mm. So that's, that's another thing that like for me is a huge breakthrough. 
It, but it's a good thing to show your story mm -hmm. and to let people follow along. That's the good, the bad, the ugly. Yep. You know, it, and, and when, when I knew I was serious about my recovery, man, I posted a mugshot. Oh, gotcha. I posted my last mugshot. Mm -hmm. And I was like, <laughs> look at this guy. My right. mugshot yeah, on he, a mug. <laughs> yeah. I was yep. like, dang. And, and I was like, yeah. And people, you know, you tell, you tell people like, hey, I was struggling. I was doing this. And they were like. We didn't know. I don't think most people didn't. Yeah. But a lot of people didn't. Because I, I let y'all see what I wanted y'all to see. That's exactly what it is. Yeah. yeah. And and now mm -hmm. I'm a I'm an open book, man. I, I, I don't care anymore. Yep. People tell me, man, you take too many selfies. I don't give a shit. <laughs> Unfollow me. Yep. Okay. <laughs> like I'm happy. <laughs> I get so much hate for because I left. Like I even gave up a six figure career to come down here and do this. And everybody's like, dude, all you do is sales. I'm like, well, I'm jealous. I hate you for this. I'm like, cool. Sacrifice everything. Take a chance and see how it works out. Mm, yeah. Dude, you, if I can do this, dude, anybody can. <laughs> I mean, Bro. that's the bottom line, you know? That that's how we feel about business, man. Yeah. People mm -hmm. are like, How did y'all get to this point, man? We just took fucking chances. Yep. We Got and you. right now we just we just I mean, there was one point where we were just like, man, let's just go all in and see what happens. <laughs> yeah, oh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, Mark, this has been a, an amazing conversation. You can find them at skeletoncrewadventures.org. Look them up on Facebook, Skeleton Crew Sailing. Yep. And then uh, stay in touch. We'll figure out a way to to get involved because this organization is doing amazing things. I want to take the time and thank you. I personally, thank you for, for coming in. We really appreciate it. Seeing you at the gala was amazing. I hope those cooks went well because it, it was funny to see you up there like auctioning yourself off. Like, uh, it was, it is like, Hey, I, I, I can cook for you guys. We're going to do this. And they're like, and they're like, can you, can you split it? Can we do it twice? And you're like, uh, yeah, we'll do it it's, twice. I was like, Oh, how am I going to work this? I got so much going on. I'm like, yeah, we'll make it work. We're going to make, make it work. It yeah. Yeah. Hey, you know, what's well, the cost. You, you sold yourself for charity. Yeah. That's so what's up. We yeah. auctioned off a two day, one night sale and I'll be there. Cause I used to be the professional chef and I'm like, I'm cooking for y'all. Yeah. So what did that go for? Um, we still probably like seven, eight hundred bucks, something like that. Was well, it more than that. If we were to do it on a regular charter, it's probably two, three thousand. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the auction went for thirty nine hundred. There you go. Damn, that's good shit. That's what it was. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's good. Yeah, that's good cool. money, right? There. Yeah, that helped out a lot. Yeah, that's amazing, man. Again, we want to continue to to man to follow yeah. your story and let yeah, us definitely. know. If there's any way that we can help you, be sure to let us know. Also, Shoot, we yeah. need funding. We need <laughs> yeah. Networking. How do people? How do people fund you? Uh, you can go on the website, hit the donate button. Um, they can get in contact with us for larger donations. We can do wire transfer, stuff like that. But uh, yeah, the biggest thing, the easiest way I should say for everybody is on our website, there's a donate button. You click on that and then donate whatever. And everything helps. Yeah. So. Okay. That's what's awesome. Up. Uh, my last question to you. Uh, we're Charlie Mike, the podcast. Charlie Mike means continue mission. So what does Charlie Mike mean to you? It's a way to get more veterans connected and get veteran stories out there and another outlet resource for connecting veterans with each other. Yeah, man. We, man, we appreciate it again. Definitely. I tell you, man, you got a fan and a friend now, brother. <laughs> it, brother. Yeah. Hey, you guys, if y'all haven't, be sure to check out my man, William on all his social medias, his Facebook, IG, TikTok at W G A R A Y J R. That's W Gray Jr. His daily motivational videos, man. Y'all check it out. I promise y'all won't be let down. Appreciate you got it. any less? No, no, man. I, you guys continue the Charlie Mike. Uh, get focused. Get involved. That's the biggest thing, man. Get involved. There's there's something for you somewhere. We need you here. Yes, we do. And you guys, man, I hope you enjoyed this podcast because I did. And talking about recovery. Man, it's something I take real serious because I live it every day. We live it every day. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, if we can do it. You can do it. And that that's the truth. That's the truth. And with that, you guys, Charlie, Mike, 